Can new mathematics help the formation of a unified theory of nature? Let's find out. This morning was a bit late, but I didn't care, so I just went ahead and prepared myself. Then I looked at the window, my apple was good, so I said to myself, Obviously the biggest problems are bringing the other forces and gravity together. Mike had sort of pointed me in the right direction by starting to look at division algebras. So there's real numbers, complex numbers, but then there's also these quaternions and octonions. So there's been a little bit of maybe controversy in the sense that recently in the community, some people have been using octonions more for physics, whereas some other people don't really see the valid use of this. And it's currently seen as sort of almost a debate between string theory and this competing theory. And you could even lump something like Garrett Lisi's E8 model as being on that other side because E8 is related to the octonions and uh, some other algebra, uh, the exceptional Jordan algebra, which is three by three octonion matrices. But if you actually look at what string theory is saying, they use E8 very intimately. And there's actually an idea that string theory should be properly formulated with the octonians, but that was never actually done. A lot of the string theorists don't appreciate that. So a lot of our work is eventually trying to bridge this gap. Um, right now, string theory and M theory are probably the best candidate for quantum gravity as a unified theory in the sense that they are ambitious enough to bring in the other forces of nature and have a theory of quantum gravity and attempt to describe them all together. But there are still some problems. There's the landscape issue of finding our low energy universe because they have so many different possibilities because they're working at such a high energy. But then there's also this other problem where the particle content required with supersymmetry makes you think that you need two times as many particles. You're going to need these super partners and that is due to the supersymmetry and we, we don't see this in nature. So there's something that needs to be figured out here and overall I think a way to think about it is what Mike is doing is he's more the mathematician looking to identify these new mathematical structures. Definitely Ed Witten a few years back would say that the mathematics for M-theory wasn't available yet. So Ed Witten introduced M-theory as this theory that would unify all the string theories and the supergravities, but it's still unclear what the precise structure of that theory was. So Mike had actually realized that there are these generalized theories that go beyond M-theory that relate to the work of Garrett Lisi. And so this is kind of an, the overlap that we've been exploring. But also, Mike was able to find these other new algebras that go beyond E8 in a new way that's pretty remarkable. So there are these finite dimensional algebras that extend the exceptional Lie algebras. So, and these Lie algebras are used in physics to describe symmetries associated with nature. So we have the standard model, which has these three forces in terms of these SUN groups that get used. And there's also SON used for rotations, and that's used for Lorentz transformations for space-time symmetry. And those are those are separate than the exceptions in the sense that you can always imagine rotating a sphere in n dimensions, and you can just increase it to n plus one, n plus two, and you can go to infinity. But what's bizarre about these exceptional Lie groups is that there's no pattern. There's just five outliers. They're kind of, they're exceptional. They're bizarre. And their mathematical structure is very curious, and they're all related to the oct octonians, actually. So since they don't follow the same patterns, especially a lot of physicists have stayed away from these objects. I mean, people have explored them as well, but it's probably a little bit more advanced. So it's at least more arcane, obscure. So what Mike has found is a way to generalize these to give us a pattern to extend it to infinity while keeping them finite dimensional, which is curious. Now they're not Lie algebras, but they still have some nice mathematical structure. So I think the first paper we did was to look at these algebras and realize that they're related to the super algebras of these super Yang Mills theories. So Yang Mills theory is used for the standard model. It, it, it's, it's a spin one, it has a spin one gauge boson that mediates forces. So we have W bosons and gluons, for example, those use SU2 and SU3 gauge groups. 
And so Yang Mills theory is a gauge theory that's non-abelian in the sense that it has nonlinear charge. And this nonlinear charge would be like weak isospin or color charge. So Yang Mills theory describes two of the forces of nature, but then you can add supersymmetry to it and get super Yang Mills. Now, one of the keys that Mike realized was that E8 has this subgroup in it that can eventually go to SO113. So that's rotations in 14 dimensions with three time dimensions. And it was realized that there was this super Yang Mills theory with that signature by uh, Sezgin and Bars and Rudy Chev, a couple other people worked on a little bit, but it's, it's pretty obscure. So the fact that this theory exists and we were able to understand how it related to E8 a bit and then generalize to these new algebras allowed us to essentially find these super algebras for super Yang Mills theories in a periodic way that generalizes to infinite dimensions. And this is, this is curious because a lot of times people think that you can't have supersymmetry in too many high dimensions in this way. So it, it, it it gives us a new way to approach these uh, these theories with supersymmetry. Go uh, going back to uh, a 1934 paper uh, by Pascal mm -hmm. Jordan, uh, von Neumann, and Wigner. So they had explored uh, these what we call Jordan algebras. Now there, there was a certain way to uh, study uh, quantum theory in a more algebraic manner. So these are algebras of observables. These days they also study von Neumann algebras, which is used for knot theory. So these are also coming back to light. And there was uh, an interesting one to four by four matrices, five by five, three was the largest. So uh, it's a, an exceptional certain type of quantum mechanics uh, that later uh, came back to light with, uh, with the study of string theory. So many of the godfathers of string theory, uh, Ramon, and you have uh, Gunaidin, uh, Sultan Kado, uh, many of uh, the instructors of even uh, the loop quantum gravity people, like as uh, Lee Smolin also was indoctrinated with uh, the Octonians a bit. And uh, Lee, Lee Smolin is uh, one of the, the creators of loop quantum gravity. So it's not as much a war as people think with uh, quantum gravity. It's everybody seeing different parts of the, the larger elephant. The larger elephant is the grand theory. And uh, there's also Eric Weinstein, so originally what David mentioned were these uh, generalized algebras that, that have the uh, like exceptional Lie algebras as a special case. So it's uh, you can think of it, I, I like to explain it as an infinite spectrum of algebras. And uh, each of these algebras uh, do contain uh, the spinner and vector uh, content of these uh, super Yang Mills theories. We can actually use them to, to predict a new class of super Yang Mills theories. So that was one of the papers we wrote. And another uh, paper, more recent paper uh, was uh, going after, after the monster group and explaining why the monster group would exist because that was one of the big questions that mathematician the late John Conway uh, was interested in that was one of his uh, great challenges in his life is to understand the origin so as far as our recent paper the origin of the monster group appears to be from a 20 27 dimensional M theory uh, where uh, the monster group is actually seeing uh, 27 dimensional graviton reduced to 26 dimensions. And uh, that's the, the reason for the certain uh, space that it acts as the symmetry zone. So that would be a very, uh, well, that's a very interesting result. And uh, more recently, it was a paper by Renata Kalosh that, that's just a few days ago. And uh, she was applying some of the work by our colleague, Alessio Morani, Mike Duff, um, and uh, Laron Borston. Uh, they had studied qubit entanglement and these uh, certain types of black holes that appear in M theory. So a special case would have an E7 symmetry, and that comes up in studies of uh, four-dimensional supergravity. So as you know, supergravity. Uh, awards were given out to Sergio Ferrara and many of the, the founders of the godfathers of supergravity recently uh, in the Breakthrough Prize. So uh, that certain cosmological model, uh, it's, it has uh, N equals one supersymmetry, which is a reduced su supersymmetry, which um, can lead to the standard model as we understand it. And Renata Kalosh had devised a cosmological model with inflation uh, using uh, seven qubits, the seven qubit structure that can be recovered from E7. So that's the exceptional uh, Lie group symmetry, E7, or it corresponds to the exceptional Lie algebra as well. So uh, in our recent studies, we've, we've, I mean, in the past few days, we've uh, connected it, we found out how to connect it to uh, the monstrous M theory paper that we came out with. So we should be writing another paper pretty soon to extract this E7 cosmology, it was seven qubit cosmology from this monstrous M theory. So that, that's, uh, that'll be 
be a new exciting paper that we're coming out with. So I'm just kind of, I'm kind of uh, giving you, you know, a sneak peek. And uh, so that's pretty much, you know, that's that's probably about the last day that we've been discussing this, but it seems to work out uh, pretty well. And um, so mainly, you know, it's it's a challenge to to get these, you know, the, the string theory and M theory, or which is, uh, so string theory is, think of it as, that's actually a special case of M theory. So M theory, you want to think M theory, and then uh, Hawking's M theory would be in 11 dimensions. So what David Chester and I are, are mentioning in our monstrous M theory paper is a 27 dimensional M theory paper that has uh, the structure of something called the leech lattice. So the leech lattice was involved with, that's behind uh, this moonshine uh, conjecture that came out a few years back with orchards. And they found that there's a 26 dimensional string theory uh, that, that that corresponds to. So what we did is we took it up to 27 and say in 27 dimensions, you can reduce this to this 26 dimensional string theory that was found by Borchards and uh, and actually got him the Fields Medal, so which is the highest prize in mathematics. So these are very exciting, strange, but exciting structures that um, are up for big prizes. You know, so what we're getting, we're definitely hot on the trail of this elephant and uh it's not only unifying physics it's unifying mathematics as well so you know you're on the right trail when it can do so many things at once and i just want to elaborate on a couple of things that uh dropped out when mike was speaking so the the algebras that were classified were for observables in quantum mechanics and you can have complex matrices that's kind of the standard thing that's done always in quantum mechanics but you can also use quaternionic matrices and with the complex and quaternionic matrices you can always make the matrices larger and larger and larger but to get a quantum mechanics based off octonians it's exceptional in the sense that you can only use three by three matrices so you can't use four by four octonionic matrices in quantum mechanics. But at that time, when it was found in 1934, they didn't fully understand the significance of what these octonians could be used for. So now if you think about where string theory came from, um, there was this bosonic string theory in 26 dimensions. And I should mention that this exceptional Jordan algebra has 27 dimensions. So it's it's not a coincidence that these are related to the, the dimensions found in, in string theory and M theory. So there's this bosonic string theory that's in 26 dimensions. Uh, later, it was eventually proposed that there's this 27 dimensional bosonic M theory, but that theory is a little mysterious because honestly, because M theory is mysterious as well. But if you consider two by two octonionic matrices instead of three by three, then you get 10 dimensional objects. So this is related to the, the 10 dimensions of super string theory. So when you have the supersymmetry, then you need to have fermions going with the bosons. You can think of the fermions as matter and the bosons as the force carriers. So in order to have these super string theories, you need to go in 10 dimensions, but then they also found these super gravities in 11 dimensions and then eventually M theory in 11. So if you imagine this three by three matrix, and then you take one of the trace elements, one of the, the elements on the trace, and then you have that two by two block, you can get this 11 dimensional structure. So there's a natural way to look at the exceptional Jordan algebra of three by three octonionic matrices and get this 27 dimensional structure. You can make it traceless to think about a 26 dimensional structure. You could take that, remove two of the octonians to get an 11 dimensional structure, or you could break that down into a two by two matrix and get a 10 dimensional structure. And if you look at all of these different approaches to quantum gravity right now, a lot of them are pointing towards this structure. So first of all, these are related to the, the exceptional Lie groups. So the, the fundamental representation representation of F4 is this 26 dimensional object. The fundamental representation of E6 is this 27 dimensional one. Um, yeah, and then you can, you actually can have this uh, tit ma tits magic square that relates two copies of division algebras to all the exceptional Lie algebras. So there's this notion of octonians crossed with um, this J3O, this uh, exceptional Jordan algebra that relates to E8. So the octonians are related to all these exceptional Lie algebras. And if you look at, let's say, well, Garrett Lisi uses E8. That's one example. But people have been studying E8 before that. And it's actually the big punch right now is there's actually a paper in 2004 that said that any theory that uses E8 has to be super symmetric. Yet Garrett's theory, he claims it isn't super symmetric. So there's this tension there. That's that's basically what needs to be resolved. That's another thing we're, that we're currently working on as well. But if you look into loop quantum gravity um, and CDT, for example, there's this uh, causal dynamical triangulation. They've been, they recently put out a paper last year that was connecting it to this exceptional Jordan algebra. 
So they're going in that direction. And let's see, what else is there? I mean, there's geometric dynamics, which really, if you think about it, is just trying to understand a geometric unification of everything such that you can have some unified field theory. And I mean, Weinstein, like Garrett Lisi worked on geometric dynamics before his 2007 paper. So there's all these different names out there. They sound very different. Twister theory, but Witten had a paper talking about how gauge theory and string theories relate to twister theory. So there's all these competitors out there, but really we see it as this giant elephant. So it's it's really hilarious for us right now because we see all these people arguing, but if you kind of zoom out, there's this larger picture of a unification of mathematics that's going on. And it's gonna lead to a reformulation of quantum field theory. Uh, Nima Arkani Hamed's working on that, for example. So I came at it from a different perspective at Mike, but we sort of met in the middle. I was a little more skeptical of supersymmetric theories at first. I just stuck to the quantum field theory and I took a quote unquote naive approach where I thought that there would be a day where quantum gravity could be approached with a quantum field theory, which most people gave up on in the 70s. But it, it turns out that I was able to find some clues there um, that I think relate to this. And it actually requires this concept called torsion, which is sourced from the quantum spin of these fermions. And this is also found in string theory, but they typically like to strip away the torsion. So it's it's often difficult to see a lot of these connections because there's so many different ways to represent the same object. And that's another remarkable thing that's happening right now is there's all these different field theories that appear to be different, yet all their solutions are related. So it's very clear to everyone that there's there's all these connections going on and people are starting to explore various dualities. But you know, I, there's something big that's connecting all of these. I mean, any anyone who's working on quantum gravity that's on the right direction, all, they all need to lead to the same direction in some way. So I think that's what we're trying to do, essentially trying to make enemies friends here. <laughs> um, like I said, there is loop quantum gravity. They maybe are a little more conservative in some regards than string theory. They're limited in their scope because they're focusing more on quantizing gravity. They're not focusing as much on matter. They're not focusing as much on charge uh, or the other forces and how that relates. But I mean, they're doing some good work and there are some papers out there that show how to relate some of the formalisms. Uh, essentially, they use this game gauge theory for gravity, and they use these Ashtekar variables. And there is a way to look at supergravity as actually being a gauge theory of gravity that is gauging the, the supersymmetry. And so there, there are some papers actually that show w what the similarities and, and differences of those formalisms are. They're, they're pretty close actually uh, from, from my perspective. And yeah, there's, there's tons of different things. Like I mentioned, CDT, that sort of spun out of Reggie calculus, which is used in loop quantum gravity. So there's just all these subtle debates over details about how, what that final theory will look like, what, what is needed for quantum gravity. So people might have different perspectives on is space time discrete? Is space time, is, should we even quantize gravity in the first place, right? So, and there's lots of theories by Einstein that can be pursued that are related to general relativity as well. So there's teleparallelism, uh, there's conformal gravity. And at first, both of these theories were thought to be uh, not, not valid, but recently, let's see, in 2013, there was a paper that found a way to relate conformal gravity to Einstein's field equations. Um, there's two different types of teleparallelism that can be made equivalent to GR in vacuum. And so these are obscure things because everyone called them Einstein's failed theory of gravity for a long time, but now it's starting to under, and now people are understanding how it's actually related to string theory. Um, there, then there's this larger theory that encapsulates general relativity and teleparallelism, uh, you can get to this theory called metric affine gravity. So this is a huge area of research for people that are looking in, who are in the general relativity community, because there, there's kind of two camps almost that split. Some people went more in the quantum field theory direction. Some people went more in the general relativity direction. And there is some cross communication, but I think a lot more is needed because there's a lot of discoveries that have been made on both ends that can be combined together. For example, uh, Poplowski was looking at Einstein Carton theory, which just adds torsion in a very benign way to general relativity. And he was actually able to make a UV complete version of quantum electrodynamics. And what that means is, it's, it's remarkable. What it means is that you only need a finite amount of energy to assemble an electron, which 
in the normal version of QED, it was thought to require an infinite amount of energy to assemble the charge of an electron. Because if you think about it, two, two charges want to repel each other, right? So if you're, imagine you have a bunch of charge at infinity that's all spread out and you want to bring it in to a single electron, right? If you just look at the equations and then you look at just normal quantum field theory, you're going to get this running of the coupling constant, which makes things worse as well. The, the force gets stronger in such a way that it seems like the actual bare charge of this particle is infinite. And this was an infinity problem found in the 1930s, let's say, and this problem gets worse with gravity. So you can sort of make sense of QED. It's philosophically confusing because of the infinities found, but you can actually get physical results and compute things. So the philosophy might be a little off, but the physics can actually compute things with electromagnetism in quantum field theory. When you go to gravity, this led to issues found in the 60s that you can't even get physics results. You, not only does the philosophy not make sense, but everything you try to calculate, just you get infinities all the t all over the place. Like you're calculating the probability of something occurring, and it's infinity. Like what? I, I need my probabilities less than one. So that's the main reason why everyone gave up on quantum field theory. But I always kind of kept a hope that there would be a possibility to fix it. And I think that Poplowski sees it. But the thing is now, everyone since the 60s and 70s has already moved on, right? They've already given up on quantum field theory. So, and this discovery was made in the pure gravity field. It wasn't made in the quantum field theory field. So the quantum field theory field hasn't embraced this research yet because probably not too many people have read it. And what that implies is that maybe there are ways to go slightly beyond general relativity that allow it to be a good quantum field theory. And essentially a lot of the different ways to go beyond general relativity place ge uh, gravity in the context of a gauge theory. Basically, gauge theories are all the quantum field theories that have been able to be successful. So Yang-Mills theory, Maxwell's theory, those can be quantized and they have a nice perturbative structure, at least. So we can quantize those theories. And so it's, it's very obvious to think, well, I can just study gravity as a gauge theory and quantize those and quantize those theories. And that essentially all the different competitors, quote unquote, out there, the vast majority of them are looking at gravity as a gauge theory, but a lot of them are obscuring that. That. So I think string theory, I mean, good string theory should realize this, um, but I, I don't know. I feel like it's something, maybe I also didn't get deep enough into that community, but I feel like it's something a little bit glossed over. Well, there's such a focus on the supersymmetry that people in the string theory community maybe just don't even study gauge gravity on itself. They just immediately dive into supersymmetry. So there's all these approaches right now, and we're just trying to figure out how to reconcile it. What Honestly, I just look at it as what is the, the most minimal model that contains all the forces of nature that we know of and can be quantized. That's sort of been my goal. And so to my surprise, I, I found that I wasn't expecting to go into supersymmetry, but I think I now see a way to look, look at a sort of hidden supersymmetry that's in the standard model, but we didn't, we haven't published that yet, but getting ahead of ourselves again, once again, those cosmology talk. Going back to these exceptional structures, there were these Yang, super Yang-Mills theories that we found in the literature that were in 11 plus three dimensions. And so we found the super algebras to arbitrarily high dimensions. And there was just a trick that needed to be done. Looking at these multiple time dimensions ended up helping us see this periodic structure. So there's this notion of bot periodicity that's worth mentioning, which refers to this periodicity when looking at the symmetries of n-dimensional spheres. So it turns out that there's this eightfold periodicity. So if you look at SO8, it's related to SO16, which is related to SO24. And so the rotations of n dimensions is related to the rotations of n plus eight dimensions. And these rotational groups can be used for, you can think of them as giving force carriers in some sense, but there's no matter there. So bot periodicity doesn't describe matter. And what Garrett Lisi got excited about was the fact that these exceptional Lie groups in include spinners. They're the only Lie algebras or Lie groups that contain spinners. So what Mike found was this magic star of a 
exceptional periodicity, we're calling it, which was a projection of all of these algebras onto this um, Star of David projection. So Piero Torini had realized, and actually other people in the literature had realized this as well, but it's a little obscure. Um, if you look at G2, which is the least exceptional Lie group, it forms the Star of David projection. And also that contains SU3, which can be used for the strong force. And that is kind of like a mini star. So G2 actually contains two stars in a way, whereas SU3 is one star. And people, and G2 is related to the Octonians. Uh, the automorphism group of the Octonians is G2. So if you look back in the history, as QCD was being developed, there was an alternative model that used the Octonians, but they never fully figured out how to connect it to that theory. And I think if you look at the work of Cole Fury and things like this, the connection is there. It just wasn't really made. And so people, as, as QCD was discovered, people just were preferred to work with a complex formulation rather than the Octonian formulation and it wasn't fully appreciated how the two formulations were actually related. So it was realized by Piero Cherini that E8 can project onto this G2 lattice in 2D. And then actually this wasn't the first way that Mike discovered it, but Mike was able to find these algebras that generalize bot periodicity. So they include this pattern where they repeat every eight dimensions and they contain these rotation groups, but they also contain spinners that are representations of that rotation group. But the, the combination of the two spinners and the rotation groups is itself an algebra. So it's a self-contained algebra that is closed that includes this notion of bot periodicity, but generalizes it to include spinners, which are known to give fermionic degrees of freedom for matter. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I just want to add that. So when, when you take E8 and you project it to the Star of David projection, it's a two-dimensional projection. The star tips actually encode the exceptional Jordan algebra that was found by Pascual Jordan, who's uh, one of Einstein's uh, buddies over in Germany, you know, back uh, during the war. And uh, so that that gives you a way to um, dissect an exceptional Lie algebra su such that you, you can see its hidden Jordan algebra structure. So during the course of one of the conferences that, that we had in San Francisco um, over at uh, one of Peter uh, Till's homes for uh, the Till Fellows, we uh, had uh, Eric Weinstein's stopped by and he mentioned uh, a 24 dimensional rotations and uh, a spinner 2048 spinner so uh, the discussion was in place to relate that to an e8 model with s uh, so 16 16 dimensional rotations and a 128 dimensional spinner so i kind of just got stuck on it and i, I just uh, worked on it all night till like maybe 3 a.m and uh, the idea was to extend the exceptional lie algebras with another family of algebras and i didn't know if they're lie algebras or not i just kind of uh, wrote them out it was a Certain, uh, I call them Yang Mills gradings because you can dissect them to see this hidden hidden spinner structure. So pretty much it was just kind of this this way to unite uh, Eric Weinstein's observations in 24 dimensions with this E8 model of uh, Lisi's. But uh, also what it ended up what ended up happening is it does have its own star projection such that at the tips you have uh, a three by three matrix structure uh, that encodes what it would look like as an 18 dimensional string theory. So that was kind of a prediction of this star projection but then later we found sure enough there was expectations that there's an 18 dimensional string theory um, from research by Peter West and his colleagues so it's interesting because the mathematics predicted something that uh, was found on the Katz Moody um, algebra side so later on of course and with discussions with Garrett Lisi we found that there's a Katz Moody algebra and exceptional periodicity duality so you had both structures at the same time. So this is definitely exciting and it's hinting at, at a higher unification because, uh, of course, uh, Garrett's new models are Katz Moody based. And if one, uh, at, as Garrett noted, uh, Borchard's algebras come into play because one can uh, one can get the Virasor algebra, which is good for a string theory because string theory uses uh, Virasor algebra to describe the vibrating string. And you also have a Katz Moody algebra, plus there's a number changing operator. So you can have this kind of expansion occurring. So this uh, expansion of terms. And uh, so our recent research has with Piero Cellini has been into looking at that kind of expansion and relating it to structures that were explored by Nima Arkani Hamid uh, that were hinted at from category theory originally. I heard them from Marnie Shepard and uh, that, that includes something called the sosahedra. And from that, that's where the, the latest amplitude hedron uh, structures were derived from. So uh, it's interesting. So one, one goes back to the notion of what's what's a manifold. Uh, manifolds were taken for granted in general 
relativity, but we have to look beyond that. Uh, Alan Cohn and uh, other mathematicians were interested in going beyond having a quantum geometry. So when you take quantum mechanics as fundamental and not these manifold structures as studied by Riemann. Yeah, these these Borchardt algebras are yeah. very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Slane's kid pointed out that they might be useful for second quantization, but they're also used in um, string theory. But it turns out Garrett Lisi is looking at them now as well. These Borchardt algebras include the Virasora algebra, which is used in string theory. But there's actually ways to Borchardtize. Virasora algebra is an extension of these Lie algebras, um, but string theory typically studies a particular Virasora algebra, but you can actually extend other algebras as well and then extend them even further to these Borchardt algebras. So these are just interesting mathematical structures that we're starting to look in more Mike a little bit more. We then first looked at all of these different super algebras for super Yang Mills theories and those were essentially given to us by these algebras of exceptional periodicity that Mike had found. And then he worked with Alesso, Alessio and Piero to prove that they were indeed closed algebras. And then while they were doing that, they realized that they could be projected onto these magic stars, which is curious. And so then that led to the study of, instead of these 14 dimensional super Yang Mills theories with 11 comma three, uh, 11 space and three time, these algebras gave us the structure that was up in 27 plus three dimensions. So then we wrote a paper that looked at 27 plus three dimensions. All right, so yeah, there's a lot going on here, but basically there's these membranes that are found in M theory that generalize strings. So a string is like a one dimensional thing and you can think of a sheet as some two dimensional thing. And so they get these brains. M theory has an M2 brain and an M5 brain, but there's also F theory, uh, which goes from 11 dimensions, 10 plus one dimensions to 11 plus one. F theory is really popular now. There's a lot more research going on to it because I think it more clearly relates to the standard model and some of the things that we found in E8 also suggest this. And then there's also this S theory, which uses 11-2 signature. So it has two time dimensions that was introduced by bars. Bars at that time noticed that these extra time dimensions were useful. And this relates to conformal symmetry because if you have, if you go back to three plus one dimensions where it's everything's makes a little bit of sense at least <laughs> normal relativity. Um, basically, Bars got obsessed with these two-time theories, which he related to the conformal symmetry, and he eventually focused on this S theory, which had signature 11-2. But there was this super Yang-Mills theory in 11-3. So it's curious because it is understood that these super gravity theories, which relate to these even more complicated M theory, F theory, and S theories, relate to super Yang-Mills theory. So in the literature as it stands, there is this 11-3 super Yang-Mills theory, but there's no 11-3 supergravity or 11-3 generalization of S theory. So I think Mike is really the one who is focused on that and saying there should be something there. And what is interesting about the, the brain structure of this super Yang Mills theory is that it does a better job at unifying uh, the, the brains that are found in supergravity. I mean, there, there are two sides to it. There, there's uh, also uh, Garrett Lisi's uh, Lee Group Cosmology where was identifying a four-dimensional subspace in signature 12-4, which is 16-dimensional. And if you take the brain, if you take the brain structure, of, if you generalize uh, Sesgin's model and Sesgin and Barr's model, uh, the two brain of M theory gets enlarged or oxidized to a four-dimensional brain. So that brain in a multi-time structure, the 12-4 signature will have a, a four time dimensions to explore. So the world volume signature is 4-4, four, 4-4. Four, four, four. And, uh, and if you reduce down to 11-3, you have uh, a three brain structure. So uh, it's almost, yeah, you have this electric source that's either three dimensional in 14 dimensions or four, four dimensional in 16 dimensions. And what's nice about 14 dimensions is that if you study that brain in its dual, which is a seven brain, and a seven brain also emerges with the type 2b supergravity, as you stated, uh, so that it's, it wouldn't be a mystery where it came from. It's actually just the, the magnetic dual of this electric three brain in 14 dimensions. And uh, what's interesting is that if you uh, study the cosmology of that magnetic brain, then it actually gives you the same uh, degrees of freedom for uh, the spinner that Garrett was interested in. So that's kind of... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the uh, the motivation so there. And if you extend that to uh, if you extend that to higher dimensions, then you have uh, you actually so that there should be the, you know just these uh, these uh, super Yang Mills theories 
these higher superior meals theories that would correspond to exceptional periodicity. Uh, if you study those magnetic brains, uh, then the cohomology of those magnetic brains actually matches up with the spinner dimensions on those higher theories as well. So uh, it's interesting to think that the spinners themselves uh, emerge from, from the cohomology of the magnetic brains from these theories. So it's not mysterious what a spinner is. It would come directly from these uh, magnetic uh, source objects. I just want to stress we're using an analogy here. There's this notion of electromagnetic duality found in Maxwell's equations, for example, and there's this S duality that's studied in M theory, but we're not talking about electric and magnetic of electromagnetism. There's this generalization of this electromagnetic duality at, that's seen at a larger scale, and it looks like essentially space time and these other internal dimensions, there is a quote unquote electromagnetic duality between those two sectors, between these two brains that's found. So, what ends up happening is that the electric brain has this world volume description that we're describing as that's going to be useful for space time, whereas the dual brain is encoding essentially all the charges associated with the, the particles themselves. So these, math, these mathematical structures describe the relationship between the brains and it's just con very convenient the way that they all come together, like everything sort of makes sense. So we have these two dual brains and we can identify how they relate to the spinners. Then what we did is we realized there was this structure in 11.3. Okay, so it's actually worth pointing out, we, we did some work on three time dimensions since we're talking about that describe three generations of matter. So we take a slightly different approach than bars, but it's, it's using the same mathematics that he used. We just switched it a little bit rather than two time dimensions. We have three. So rather than looking at like SO42, we looked at SO33 and rather describing conformal symmetry, we described there's this internal SO3, which ha has been discussed in the literature by uh, Wilsch we'll, we'll and Z. That's actually found in the SO18 grand unified theory. But we don't need to get into that too much. But basically, we have these three time dimensions, which simply point out these three different generations of matter. And with this structure, you can have three different spinners that are efficiently um, encoded in the six dimensional space time. But these three spinners all have to have the same charge. And this can be used for the standard model because we find an electron, a muon, and a tau. They all have the same charge, but they have different mass. So we're essentially finding that there's different space times for these particles, which I, I think it makes sense to connect it to time because we know that mass is related to energy and energy is conjugate to time. So it just makes some sense there. But I had also, had also seen in the scattering amplitudes community that you can use six dimensional spinners to get uh, four dimensional spinners. So that gave me the clue to understand, well, I can use this three dimensional time then to have some six dimensional spinner. And this helps fix the problem with Garrett Lisi's E8 model because when you go to this six dimensional spinner, you get an efficiency that occurs. You need less degrees of freedom than you would otherwise need. And what happens is, all right, so for a Dirac spinner for a fermion, there's this notion of on-shell and off-shell degrees of freedom. The on-shell ones are the classical degrees of freedom and the off-shell are the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And typically there's two times as many off-shell as on-shell. So if I have an electron, it has spin right, it has spin left. And then there's also a positron with spin right and spin left. So there's four on-shell degrees of freedom, but then you need eight off-shell to describe the whole full quantum mechanical spinner. So um, basically, if you had three generations of that with this six dimensional space time mechanism, you only need 16 dimensions or sorry, um, yeah, degrees of freedom. And those 16 can give you three different four sets of four on-shell degrees of freedom for the three generations. So you need 16 instead of 24. And the problem with Garrett Lisi's model is that it's, in, it's known that if you use four dimensional space time, you need 192 degrees of freedom to describe the fermions. But- So that was Garibaldi and, uh, and Dissler's mm -hmm. argument against his model. That was the biggest argument is, let's assume you use E8 four-dimensional space-time. You can't use it to describe the standard model because you're not going to have enough degrees of freedom. But with the six-dimensional model, you can describe it with 128. And 128 is precisely the number of spinners found in E8. So this helps clarify how to, um, how to fix that problem. And 
So then if you think about what SO124 was, it's actually the conformal symmetry of SO113. So now we understand what the three dimensions of time means. And similar to how bars just looked at uh, two dimension of time as a conformal symmetry of one generation. Well, I mean, yeah, it was one generation. He didn't really articulate that. But from our perspective, the three times is three generations, which would then have some conformal symmetry with four times. And then there's also this additional, so that would get you to SO44. And then there's this other internal SO8 that encodes the charges of the standard model, but in a very cryptic way. And this is another part of the reason why it's been so difficult to entangle, uh, entangle this. But so then we look back at exceptional periodicity and could go up and we could go up to 28 comma four. And now we understand that we should take away an SO11 to get down to the space-time symmetry rather than the conformal symmetry. And that leads us to SO27.3. And honestly, it was more Mike and Alessio here. What they were doing was looking at, at this theory and they realized that there is this other hey, duality there's that occurs brain. there. Right, 11 brain. 11. You get this 11 brain, right? Mm -hmm. And so that generalizes the, uh, the M2 brain and M theory or the M3 brain. And what this suggests is the picture where there's sort of nested brains that's occurring so just like this uh, bot periodicity that david mentioned earlier if you'd apply that to these uh gauge theories as you go down a dimension you can have this larger theory but uh if you're studying the world volume theory of one of these brains then uh, these extra degrees of freedom will be collapsed to like a point uh, they're like fibers so as they describe them in mathematics they're uh, in in fiber bundle theory so that's uh that's this nesting that occurs so as you descend down if you go up to 27.3 you can find a, a world volume in there with 11.3 signature and that 11 brain world volume can be used to reduce down to this 14 dimensional theory that uh, Seskin and bars were studying and so within the 11 dimensional brain world volume there are brains within that so that's this nesting so within the 11 brain, you have this three brain and seven brain that are electric magnetic dual. And this three brain, if you take it seriously, then uh, this three brain world volume with its three, three signature actually predicts that there should be three generations of particles. So it's interesting because you're not putting in the generations by hand. You're just taking the multi-time seriously and the electric brain seriously. And as a result, you get this tripling of this uh, spinner structure that uh, leads to a three generation uh, picture, but it's it's very uh, non-trivial because uh, you know there there's of course uh, many issues with multi-time um, because you can there, there's just causality um, issues, so some people stay away from that. But uh, Bars was able to get it work for two, and I did ask Bars about three, and he just mentioned that we need to uh, as as long as we can eradicate the ghosts, uh, that would be the only issue. And uh, David also looked into. Uh, the ghost issue for three times. Yeah, we figured that out. I mean, essentially, it's very easy to look at what bars did and just generalize it. Yeah. So actually, what we did mathematically can be used for an arbitrary number of time dimensions. You just get these larger internal gauge theories. What a gauge theory really is, is redundant degrees of freedom. So it's just a way to get rid of those unphysical degrees of freedom that people would worry about that would violate unitarity. So well, we're, I mean, so we're, we're kind of connecting two papers. So if you actually read the literature, you wouldn't be able to see all these connections even uh, because we're kind of combining this three, three generation paper with the uh, 27 plus three paper, but obviously they are related. So the 27 plus three paper, we were just trying to show how to get M theory, but we understand that there is this three, three time generalization. And we had another paper that looked at the standard model from E8 and looked at the three, three time aspects. And there, what you find is you get this notion where you have SO31 that has physical generators associated with Lorentz transformations. And then you have this SO3, which which can be used for rotating between the three different particle generations. And we basically found that there's this non-trivial way to embed those together in an SO33. So uh, basically, if you follow bars and just switch the signatures, the exact same procedure holds for our construction as well. And I did notice that it does work for any number of time dimensions as well. But 
so it's it's but it's really curious that three is picked out and it seems to relate to the split octonians because there are these division algebras we have this bot periodicity the octonians relate to so8 in a way but then there are these split division algebras and so they're the split octonians and those relate to so44 so now we understand fully that this so44 is a conformal symmetry for three generations so it's it's curious because this this matching of the dimensionality between space and time naturally gives three dimensions and this is something that i i don't think garrett fully appreciates and you can see like eric weinstein he'll talk about his model and you can see he's confused about this because he's he says well i have these spinners they're in powers of two so he's like well I think there's really two generations, not three, because he, he doesn't see this trick. But well, I mean, it, you have to, yeah, you have to uh, um, invoke the brain structure. And but to make a full circle, I don't know, I don't know if we mentioned this or not, but Eric Weinstein was actually inspirational to discovering these uh, these these mathematics in the first right, place. The exceptional periodicity. Yes. <laughs> so and, and his advisor was a uh, raw bot that uh, the originator of you know, right. the creator of uh, bot periodicity. So it was, a, it was a, yeah, an interesting uh, synchronicity there. So there's this notion of SO8 triality. And actually, this, is, this can actually be used to describe how supersymmetry works. Uh, it describes why SO91 spacetime is, is useful for getting supersymmetry, because there's this coincidence that happens that the on-shell degrees of freedom for the spinners and the, the vector boson for the force carriers, they happen to both give eight dimensions. So the, in SO8, you have a vector of eight dimensions, but then you also get these chiral spinners that also have eight dimensions. So there's a notion of triality associated with SO8. And so I wasn't even at this the conference. The superstring theory. I mean, that, yeah. that in itself. Uh, and uh, that was even mentioned uh, by, uh, you had uh, Schwartz and, uh, and Green who were uh, studying, I mean, uh, studying actually uh, trying to get an octonionic version of superstring theory to work and uh that in itself would have this this triality built in right so eric weinstein was at this conference that mike was hosting and he was just scribbling some numbers on the board talking about this weak triality in 24 dimensions and no one knew exactly what he was talking about but uh mike was staring at this and realized that well if there's this try, and we know how SO8 comes out of E8. So Mike was just thinking, well, there should be some way to get the spinner with the SO24 in some algebra, perhaps. And that's that's what led to that. So it's curious. But this is actually also a good point to mention that there's another construction that relates E8 to the leech lattice. So you can take three copies of E8. <laughs> and get to this 24 dimensional lattice. Yeah, yeah that was Robert Wilson. Lattice. Robert Wilson, Wilson realized this. Buddy, yes. Dixon as well, maybe didn't do it perfectly right, but was very yeah, close Dixon it looks well. like. So yeah, that, that was done. And this kind of relates to our more recent paper, which was this notion of monstrous M theory. And so what we realized, well, Mike had a really good observation we already were going up, we were already comfortable going up to SO28.4, which is something that the string theorists wouldn't really go to. And what Mike had realized is that the, he was looking at cohomology, he was thinking about Pascal's triangle a lot, and you can get these uh, P forms, which, uh, which can be found. So supergravity ha has a P form. And so the problem with why you can't have supersymmetry in higher dimensions is because the spinners start to grow at an exponential rate and, and, and the bosons don't grow as fast. But there's a clue because supergravity introduces this uh, three form uh, that, that is a boson that supplements the bosonic sector to, to match the fermions because the supersymmetry requires an equal number of bosons and fermions. So, what we eventually were able to find is that there is this theory in 27 dimensions that has the same number of bosons and fermions. And we didn't prove that it's supersymmetric, but it looks like it will be. It's just uh, gonna be a little bit of non-trivial proof to, to do it, but we wrote down the, the supersymmetric transformations for it. And it looks pretty standard, actually. It looks pretty, pretty tame in the way. It, it, there weren't too many surprises um, but basically, 
what Mike realized is that if you go up to 30 dimensions and you get this five form, you can basically break that down to 27 dimensions. And then you get this, this combination of all these P forms and it's a complicated mess unless you see where it comes from in higher dimensions. So if you are just going to 27 dimensions and looking for this theory, I mean, you could brute force it and write some algorithm to figure out all the possibilities and get something to work, but having this unified structure that breaks it down really helps understand it in a simple way because otherwise, I mean, I'm trying to remember the, num the total number of forms that we end up getting, but there's something like, let's say 10 or 15, a dozen or so yeah. different fields that are needed to add it to supplement the bosonic sector because the, the, the spinners, the fermions are so large at this level. And then so I might realize that. And the thing that's interesting is that the, these P forms relate to the leech lattice because you have, um, I, I, so I think it's a 28 choose five and 28 choose 23. <laughs> If you add those numbers together, you get the same number as the leech lattice. Yeah, the, the number of roots. Vectors, yeah. You get the same exact number. And so but, this notion of the five and the Yeah, it's right. These, these forms are, you can look at them from that perspective as generating the leech lattice. It's like the leech lattice is secretly these higher P forms collapsed to lower dimensions. So similar to how SO8 is found in supersymmetry at the lower level, we can look to SO24, and we know that 24 dimensional rotations relate to the leech lattice. So it's, it's curious that we're finding this relationship there. And similar to how you have an M2 and M5 brain, you typically pick the M2 brain. So we do the same thing up here. We pick that, the, all the, the P forms coming from the, the five forms there, we break that down. And then Alessio came in and realized that there was this gravitino that you could have in 27 dimensions that ends up having 98,304 dimensions, whereas the half of the leech lattice gave us 98,230, um, I believe. I think that's the number. Uh, yeah, 196, 560 divided by two, uh, 280 it should be. 90 <laughs> the numbers get big. So we get this 98, 280. And then we realize that if you break that 27 dimensional theory to 26 dimensions, you can add in a graviton and then just do the simple replacement of one of the, the P forms for another P form. And then you're able to get a theory that has 98, 304 bosons and 98, 304 fermions. We found basically three different numbers that are all very close. And we found this family of different theories that relates to all these different numbers. And so we we're calling this the monstrous theories of gravity. So we're adding a graviton in with these P forms, we had this spinner and well, actually there was different theories we could get. There was a purely bosonic theory. And then there are these other theories. We had these notions of weak triality. So we revisited this concept from Eric Weinstein and basically made all of these theories from these weak trialities by basically these number, these coincidences of different field contents having the same numbers. If you look at the monster group, it acts on this, this Greece algebra, which contains this uh, 100, was it 196, 884. So we were looking for all these theories with that many degrees of freedom. And then we were looking to see what happened. And then that's when we realized there is this one theory that had a single spinner with 98304. And then that clued us in, well, maybe there could actually be some super symmetry in 27 dimensions, which you wouldn't think would be possible. There's a paper by Nam who basically says that you can only have supergravity up to 11 dimensions and that's it. But what it seems like the workaround is the fact that there's this nested brain structure. So part of the argument for Nam to deny supersymmetry in supergravities in higher dimensions, I mean, it's not a bulletproof argument. If you actually read the paper, they essentially say, well, we know we need to reduce to four dimensions. We can compactify this way and you do these simple arguments and they basically say you can only go up to 11 dimensions with this way that we know and we can't think of anything else so therefore it's not possible to go beyond but it's not really a proof it's it's a good motivation to focus on that for a while and it's a good thing to do but it's not a bulletproof mathematical proof so this notion of nested brains allows us to go further and it's good because we see we're not going directly from 27 dimensions to four dimensions we go to the lower super gravities and connect the there and then you can break down through these uh, nested world volumes so now it's a it different like... kind of compactification we're just we're, yeah you you study the world volume theory right so now we're, we've gone beyond e8 
and we're looking at this Greece algebra, which relates to the monster. And we're finding that it seems to be related to these theories that are sort of like a bosonic M theory, except now there's matter as well, because usually the, uh, the bosonic string theories, they don't have fermions in these higher dimensions, but these mathematical structures give it to us. And then we, we can kind of reduce them from there and find these lower dimensional theories. And so Mike has been going on the mathematical side, going into really high dimensions and coming down. And then I've been working more at the lower dimensions, working with the standard model more specifically and trying to look up and see how we can meet in the middle. And that's pretty much where we're at today. <laughs> Long ago, my intuition kind of led, led me down the wrong you know, direction sometimes. So I learned to just trust the math and let the math guide me and then try to figure out what it's saying physically after the fact. So if the math is saying multi-time, then of course I follow that and explore it. And uh, that's something that has been very fruitful. And uh, there are new surprises as well. And if something independent, if you have this independent mathematical structure, what, what I did find with exceptional periodicity is I found that exceptional periodicity, these algebras that do generalize the exceptionally algebras, they do, I mean, if you study them with, uh, if you decompose these, uh, so instead of Jordan algebras for these, these higher uh, algebras, the magic star algebras, uh, sometimes we call them, uh, and you dissect them with the star projection, then at the star tips, you no longer have a Jordan algebra, but you have T algebras. And those T algebras under a fixed point, you fix one of the idempotents and it splits this three by three matrix into spinner and a vector part and these can be used to formulate matrix string theories beyond 10 dimensions so you can have an 18 dimensional one you can have a 16 dimensional one and there are higher ones so these uh fixed points actually give you a decomposition of these t algebras that were originally found by vimberg I, I had rediscovered them i was calling them jordan pierce factors and uh because it's a it's a pierce decomposition that one can apply to this exceptional jordan algebra you know, found by Pascal Jordan. So uh, these give you under Pierce decomposition, right? You at this fixed point, you have this these spinners and, and vector part that match up with uh, these, what you expect from uh, string theory in 26 dimensions and 10 dimensions. And uh, well, it also, it actually predicts that there should be a hidden spinner in 26 dimensions, not just a purely bosonic theory. So that's interesting as well. But there doesn't seem to be a contradiction between the mathematics and string theory. And uh, as I said, it, the mathematics itself uh, predicts an 18 dimensional string theory and higher dimensional string theories after that. But the sweet spot definitely might be the 26. And that's due to other arguments that come up even in lattice theory uh, with um, the Lorentzian uh, lattice in 26 dimensions and how one can derive the, the leech lattice there. So personally, I mean, just looking at the at this mathematics, I, I, I see an infinite tower of nested uh, super Yang Mills theories. And um, so I have that in the back of my head and um, I, I'm very open to uh, new connections between uh, mathematical structures and uh, also different physical approaches, uh, loop quantum gravity, um, causal dynamical triangulations and just purely algebraic approaches as Cole Fury and um, Lee Smolin have been working on and also Garrett Lisi. So I, I think it's looking good. We're, we're, there's definitely a convergence occurring right now. And uh, with time, if we get more researchers to actually jump on this and run more simulations, uh, because when, when they're finite dimensional structures, we can uh, put them, you know, code them in uh, to uh, certain simulations and um, just run them and, and try to uh, explore like where the quantum gravity research, uh, they're more on the computational side and they, they've been studying the, the E9, E10, uh, E11 and E12 uh, Katz Moody structures. So that's very exciting as well. And we'll see what comes of that as far as an emergent uh, picture of space time. Um, for me, I guess I'm amazed that there's so many different approaches to quantum gravity that all seem to actually be converging to the same point. If you look in pop culture, it seems like there's all these competing theories out there, but we're actually starting to see how they all, all paths lead to Rome, as they say. So that really entices me. So I was someone who was a little bit skeptical of string theory and found my own description of the standard model and then was surprised to realize that it seems like supersymmetry is here. So uh, I'm just very encouraged that it does seem like there is this pinnacle moment that is happening. I think there is this sort of uh, new revolution that's happening in the field. And there's been a lot of progress in the past year, two years. Just the, the amount of papers that have been coming out, it's it's remarkable. Every day, like Alessio and I are just sending papers back and forth and we can see everyone like converging to this point and it's just really exciting. So I'm just happy to, honestly, I'm just happy to be able to understand a small piece of it. <laughs> Right. Yeah, we've come a long way. And... Hello, Michael. Are you are you driving? I'm just sitting. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you guys. Uh, Thank you.
hello again. Do you have report? Report on? Yeah, it's on now. One minute. Perfect. If my laptop dies, then you know that I signed off for it. Okay, I'm just reporting you in advance. How long do you think you got? Like 30 minutes. All right, let's. Might as well dive in. He might be frozen. Avira Sora Algebra. <laughs> Maybe his laptop just died. There we go. Thank you, Sue. Makes sense. Finally, we made it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sue. And I'm sure we got the recording. <laughs> Finally, we got it. Oh, we've got a recording. Yeah, we've got the recording, and you know. We're